It was the end of the 18th century, and for France, they'd be going out with no shortage of blood. The French Revolution of 1789 brought a new government to the country, led by a national assembly that overhauled their laws and stripped the king and the Catholic Church of power. But more radical elements in the revolution were growing stronger, and they didn't just want their old powers removed, they wanted them dead. The execution of King Louis XVI in January 1793 was the beginning, but it would be far from the last execution, and that led one woman to decide it had to be stopped. The National Assembly was initially led by the Girondins, a loosely affiliated group of activists who supported the end of the monarchy. They were considered moderates and were affiliated with American revolutionaries like Thomas Paine. But another group was growing tired of the moderate pace. They were called the Jacobins, and on May 31, 1793, they got their opportunity. It would be three days of bloody conflict, and a new power would emerge. They were the Montagnan, and their rise launched what would become known as the Reign of Terror. And with this shift in power, the French Revolution changed from an instrument of reform to one of revenge. The Committee of Public Safety, led by Georges Danton, and later by Maximilien Robespierre, aimed to hunt down the enemies of the revolution, both foreign and domestic. And it didn't take much to make that list. But many thought the most powerful figure in the revolution wasn't those in government, it was the man who spread their word. His name was Jean Paul Marat, and few names struck more fear into the French hearts. A journalist and a political theorist, Marat was one of the most radical supporters of the revolution, and he was known for his relentless defense of the sans culottes. This radical worker-led group made up the bulk of the revolutionary army, and had no problem getting their hands dirty and handling executions personally. His newspaper, L'Ami du Peuple, frequently advocated violence against enemies of the revolution, and led many to accuse Marat of being a dangerous man, a claim he likely wouldn't dispute. Marat had been deeply sick in 1788, but hearing that Louis XVI's reign was in trouble, he claimed to be given a new burst of life. But few factions would be radical enough for Marat. Originally aligned with the Gendon, Marat quickly left and aligned with Danton. His newspaper led attacks against members of Louis XVI's court, forcing them to flee the country. His paper also published alarmist articles about the threat of counter-revolutionaries, and he had only one solution to the problem, executions, and plenty of them. For the first few years of the revolution, he was repeatedly forced into hiding as an outlaw. But soon enough, his brand of politics would get their day in the sun. Mara was heavily involved in the insurrection of August 10, 1792, which led to the abolition of the monarchy. And with that, Mara gained more influence, including becoming the head of the Committee on Surveillance that targeted those that they felt weren't loyal enough to the revolution. Over 4,000 were soon arrested, but Mara wasn't satisfied with this and advocated that the prisoners should all be burned alive. This was voted down due to the threat of spreading fire, but he would get his wish for blood soon enough. On September 2, 1792, thousands of prisoners were brought out of the prison and impromptu trials were held in a courtyard. Those found guilty would be butchered, speared, or decapitated by ruthless bands of mercenaries brought in to oversee the punishment. When the initial massacres were done, they went into the prison and killed people in their cells. No one was safe, with priests and young people accused of being counter-revolutionaries falling victim. This would be known as the September Massacre, and many in Paris were horrified at what was being done in the name of revolution. But no one was more horrified than Charlotte Corday, a minor aristocrat. Corday lost her mother and sister at a young age. Her father sent her away to live in a convent, but that gave her a unique benefit, access to a library. As a girl, she read the works of philosophers like Plutarch, Voltaire, and Rousseau. A small woman, she became the sole heir to a moderate estate, and had reason to fear that the revolution's excesses would eventually reach her. As it started, she sided with the Jordan, and watched in horror as they were eventually purged by the Montagnards and their allies. The September Massacre was the last straw. Something needed to be done. Corday viewed Mara not as a revolutionary leader, but as an enemy of France. She was shocked by the execution of the king, and thought that Mara was likely to incite a full-on civil war in France that could leave countless dead. And as the reign of terror ramped up, she feared that she was being proven right. On July 9, 1793, she left her cousin's home and headed for Paris, carrying a long knife. Mara was a powerful man, but he had one weakness. He suffered from a painful skin condition for years, and treating it had become difficult. It had forced him to retire from active politics, and many members of the leadership were distancing themselves from him. There was only one thing that alleviated the symptoms, long soaks in bath treated with minerals and medicine. By the time Corday came looking for him, he spent most of his time in the bath, and there he soaked on July 13th when a young woman appeared at his apartment. She claimed to have information on fugitives, enemies of the revolution. Mara's wife Simone had suspicions, but Mara was obsessed with finding any enemies of France. He invited Corday in and gave her an audience at his bath side. She claimed to know about the escaped Jordan, who had escaped to Normandy, and they talked about 15 minutes. She gave him names, and Mara boasted to her that within a fortnight they would all be arrested, tried, and guillotined. Mara didn't have the power 
to guillotine anyone anymore, but that didn't matter. Corday had heard enough. She pulled the long knife out of her corset, stabbing Mara directly in the chest. This caused massive bleeding and Mara died in only seconds after crying out to his wife for help. Simone rushed into the room alongside one of Mara's distributors, and Corday was taken into custody quickly. While two neighbors tried to revive Mara to no effect, an angry crowd gathered, ready to murder Corday on the spot. But the local officials wouldn't have it. They wanted her to stand trial as an enemy of the revolution. Corday had not expected to come back from her mission, and she sent a letter to her father. It was intercepted, and it would be read at her trial. She claimed that she had avenged many innocent victims and prevented far worse, and this was used as evidence by the prosecutors that she was not a simple madwoman, but an assassin who had planned her killing of a political figure. When interrogated, she stated her support for the revolution and its republican ideals, but not for the actions of radicals. But many suspected a bigger conspiracy. The prosecution and many high-ranking revolutionary figures thought Corday might have been a pawn of the Girondin, who had escaped and were plotting to overthrow the government. They argued that Corday had killed Marat too effectively to not be trained, but Corday maintained her story throughout the trial. She had worked alone, creating the plan and executing it alone. She claimed luck alone guided her knife. She knew what awaited her, and she was unafraid. Her initial choice of a lawyer wasn't informed in time, so her court-appointed lawyer had no luck. Corday was quickly convicted and sentenced to death, and only four days after she stabbed Mara, she would face the guillotine. During her trial, she made her motivations clear. She believed Mara was a dangerous man, and her quote became famous, I killed one man to save 100,000. But to the supporters of Mara's faction, she was the greatest monster in France, and they would see vengeance. With only a few days to live, Corday asked to have her portrait painted so she would be recorded for history. Her painter, Jean-Jacques Howard, took pains to protect himself from reprisals by putting in minor details in the art that would make Corday look like a vain aristocrat. He had to be careful to ensure that no ally of Mara's would take offense, because anything could get him sent to the guillotine right after. Corday's execution would be the biggest event in Paris. On July 17, 1793, she faced the guillotine alone, wearing the traditional clothing to denote a condemned traitor. Executions were so common during this period that their clothing was used to indicate what they were being executed for in some cases. The execution went smoothly, with her head falling off in a single stroke. But that wasn't the end of the affair. A man named Le Gros approached the basket and picked her head up, slapping it in front of the crowd. While some claimed that Corday's face reacted, there's no evidence that people survive even seconds after being decapitated. Who did react? The crowd, outraged at this insult to a dead woman even if she was a murderer. Le Gros wound up being sent to prison for three months. Corday's act would have wide-reaching impacts, but not the one she was hoping for. The Jacobins and the Allies in power used Marat's death to increase their grip on France. Marat became a martyr, with a bust of him being placed in a prominent position and building names being changed to honor him. Female activists in France were quick to distance themselves from Corday, fearing that the murder would lead the Jacobins to crack down on feminism in France. Women's political clubs were soon banned, and there seemed to be an increase in the execution of female activists who were seen as Girondin supporters. But not all of the French condemned Corday. André Chenier, a French poet, wrote a controversial poem about Corday that talked about the supposed masculinity she possessed and mocked all the men who wouldn't have the strength to do what she did. This was a risky move, and sure enough, he soon aroused the ire of powerful people in the Montagnon for insulting their fallen hero's memory. He wound up following her to the guillotine, being executed only days before the reign of terror would come to an end. But there would be one last twist to Madame Guillotine's reign. The reign of terror had long since grown out of control, with even early leader Georges Danton being sent to face the guillotine after being accused of being too lenient against enemies of the revolution. By now, Robespierre was the undisputed leader of the revolution, and arrests and executions ramped up massively. He even tried to found his own new state religion. Eventually, his cruelty grew too much for the government to bear, and they secretly voted him out of office, followed quickly by his arrest and execution. And July 28, 1794 marked the end of the reign of terror. Charlotte Corday had not lived to see it, but her legacy would endure. Marat's death would be immortalized in a painting by Jacques-Louis David, with many criticizing it for making Marat look like a martyr and glorifying him. Other media would be more sympathetic to Corday, especially after the fall of Robespierre. Poems, songs, plays, operas, and movies have been made about the case. You could even solve Marat's murder in a level of the Assassin's Creed video game. Charlotte Corday's killing of Marat might not have stopped the reign of terror in its tracks, but it might have pushed it toward its inevitable self-destruction, as the leadership became increasingly paranoid and brutal. A full year and 11 days passed between her death and Robespierre's, and today a lot of people look at her and say she knew what was coming and gave her life to try to stop it. For more on this chaotic period, check out the French Revolution in a nutshell, or watch this video instead.